please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. We're on the record, case number 12, CF 1083, State versus George Zimmerman. Give you a few mo moments to get your stuff together. And
Okay, are we ready to bring the jury in? Yes, Your Honor. Defense? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, let's go ahead and bring the jury in. Please be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice weekend. Um, if your answer is yes to any of my questions, please raise your hand during the recess, the weekend recess. Did any of you have discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No, no hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case? No, no hands are being raised. Did any of you use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology. No, no hands are being raised. And finally, did any of you read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case? No, no hands are being raised. Thank you very much. Um, is it, I don't know whose next witness it is, but put, defense, please call your next witness. Yes, Defense will call Sandra Osterman. Sound like swear affirm that the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah. Yes. I might have a moment to. Looks as though this is not the traditional computer from this courtroom, so the login is not on it. If we don't know it, I may need a minute to just use mine. Asking, I'll begin with her. Okay. Morning, ma'am. State your name, please. Sandra Osterman. And you live here in Seminole County? Yes. How long have you lived in Seminole County? Um, 16 years. Okay. And um, are you married? Yes. And who are you married to? Mark Osterman. And he's testified before. What's his occupation? He's a uh, federal air marshal. Okay. And He's been involved in law enforcement quite some time, hasn't he? Yes. Okay. And how long have you been married? Almost 17 years. Okay. You know George and Shelley Zimmerman? Yes. Tell me how you met George. I met Georgie at um, a mortgage company called First Trust. 
back in 2006. Okay. And was that a place where you worked together? Yes. And what type of work did you do back then? Mortgage business. And was Mr. Zimmerman doing something similar? Yes. He was in the sales and I was uh, processing. Okay. Did you guys become friends over the time that you worked together? Yes. Did you maintain that friendship? Yes. And it's that friendship that brings you here today, is that correct? Yes, it is. And I know that you were present or around during the time both preceding the event that brings us here and, of course, right after the event, correct? That's correct. What I'd like to do, however, today is just focus your attention on one subject of that. And um, that is the, what we are calling the Lauer 911 tape. To identify to you, that's the tape that has um, uh, a voice in the foreground. Turns out her name is Miss Lauer. Voices in the background, or a voice in the background. And then um, what we now know to be the gunshot that um, killed Mr. Martin. Right. Um, so before we get to that, tell me, over the past few years, how often would you and George Zimmerman interact? Well, we worked with each other every day. And then um, his wife and I were best friends, and we'd all kind of hang out together, um, okay. at least every week or so. All right. Have you then had a good opportunity to hear George's voice? Yes. Would that be in person? Yes. And over the phone? Yes. Um, if you would tell the jury um, sort of the range, I mean, would you hear him, not to lead you, but talking, laughing, just sort of go through the different types of conversations or voices, if you will, that you heard? I would hear him talking and laughing and maybe a little frustrated. <coughs> and um, was it, would this be sort of over the several years that you've known him? Right, yes. Okay. Now, you acknowledge that you're a good friend of his, correct? That's correct. Um, and you guys have helped each other out over the years, correct? That's correct. Um, certainly, you helped out or helped the family through the initial stages of this event, correct? Yes. Um, then there was a time when you could no longer have contact with him? Yes. Because of the case? Yes. Okay. Still maintain a friendship, though, from afar? As far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, would your friendship with him impact on how you're going to testify today regarding what you may hear on the tape? As far as what I lie? Well, I guess that's the easier, that's a non-lawyer way to say it. I, I wouldn't lie for him or, or anybody. Okay. And let me, if I might, Your Honor, um, play what's already in evidence as Exhibit 158. You may do so. chance to listen to that tape before today? Yeah. And on how many occasions? Um, a few. Okay. Um, do you have, uh, do you know whose voice that is uh, in the background screaming? Yes, definitely. It's Georgie. And how? I 
I just hear, I, I hear it. I hear him screaming. Nothing further, Your Honor, this witness. I'm going to leave this here. This is in case the state wants to replay it. I'll show you how to do it on this computer. If not, I'm going to leave it here for other witnesses. Okay, thank you. We may need to put another one. Can you put the one in the sanction? Sure. Oh, I apologize. Uh, no, no problem at all. I'm just going to. I'm sure she knows better than either one of us, but let me undo this. <clears throat> being set up, Mr. Ms. Osterman. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you and your husband wrote a book on behalf of the defendant, did you not? Let me object, Your Honor, outside the scope of direct. Your Honor, it shows bias. I would like a proffer of how that issue would bias. Okay. Overruled. You and your husband, Mark Osterman, wrote a book, um, a title of it, right, regarding Mr. Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. And um, I believe you stated uh, that you and your husband, whatever money was made, you were going to donate it to Mr. Zimmerman. Is that correct? To his cause? Yes. Okay. So you would agree that you have a stake in this, don't you? A stake? Yeah, in terms of the book. How many books have been sold as a result of Mr. Zimmerman being charged with this crime in terms of you all? How many books have you guys sold? I have no idea. And all the money that is being made from that book, are you all profiting it or are you donating the profits to Mr. Zimmerman's? Actually, we're depositing it into our uh, savings for George after. Okay, you keep saying George. It's George Zimmerman. We're talking about the defendant, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and I believe you've known Mr. Zimmerman for how long? Since 2006. And you met him through work. That's correct. And in fact, you ended up marrying he and his wife, correct? That's correct. And uh, he is left-handed, correct? Yes. Now, regarding the, the recording that was played uh, for you, you had heard this, you heard it two or three times, you said, or four times? I'm a, just a few times. Okay. Did it take you a while to, to figure out who was actually yelling? Absolutely not. You from the first time you very heard it, you knew? I apologize, I interrupted you, ma'am. The very first time I knew it was George. So why did you have to listen to it more than once? Because it's played on the news all the time. Okay. And the first time you heard it was on the news? Yes. And so on the news they had the it was dealing with this case, George Zimmerman, correct? Yes. Okay, so you were aware that the recording was dealing with George Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. And that in no way influenced you in reaching your opinion that this was George Zimmerman on the, on the recording? No. Okay. Now, uh, you had it lined up. Ma'am, listen to this and tell me if you recognize this voice. Mr. De Laronda, there's an objection. Actually, just a request for what exhibit it is. What exhibit are you playing, please? It is part of the 911 call that the defendant made. I didn't want to tip her off in terms of the recording, and that's why I'm purpose. Okay, go ahead. Then I didn't mean to get in the way. Well, now you know what I'm going to play for you. I was trying to do it so that, but you have heard this recording before, correct? I don't know. Okay, let me play. Let me play a part. See if you recognize this. Okay. These assholes—they always get away. Do you recognize that voice? Yes. And who is that voice? Is saying, pardon my language, these assholes—they always get away. That's Georgie. 
George Zimmerman? Yes. You know, by in court, we were supposed to uh, give their. I apologize. Let's go up here. Okay. Let's give you recognition. Don't turn to me, Glock. He's running. He's running. Which way is he running? Uh, down towards the uh, entrance of the needle. Okay. Which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. Did you recognize that, boys? Yes. And was that Mr. Zimmerman too? Yes. When he uttered the words, uh, these, pardon my language, these fucking punks? Oh, I didn't hear that. You didn't hear that? No. I can play it again if you want. Uh, yeah, he goes straight in. Don't turn to make a left shit. He's running. He's running? Which way is he running? Uh, down towards the uh, entrance of the needle. Okay, which entrance is that that he's heading towards? Back Do you recognize that voice of being George Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. Now, you had never actually heard the 911 tape other than when you heard it when it was being played, George Zimmerman, but you had not heard the defendant screaming before, had you? Like that? No. Yes. No. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Just a bit, Your Honor. Do you need this? No, no, that's okay. So you heard him say the word assholes, right? Yes. On the tape? Yes. And you've heard him talk for years now, correct? That's correct. Did that word, the way he said assholes, did that give you a sense that he was acting with spite or ill will or hatred in that sense? No. Did that seem to be just to be an offhand way of talking to whoever it was he was talking about? Yes. Did you, knowing as you do George's voice throughout the years, did, did you even hear, by the way, the second time, did you hear him say the, the expletive that Mr. Deliondo repeated? I didn't hear that, no. So even the second time when you were answering it, you were saying generally that's George, George Zimmerman's voice? Correct. But you couldn't even hear the words fucking punks on that? No, I didn't hear that. Okay. Even turned up as loud as it could be, you still couldn't hear it? I didn't hear it, no. In everything that you heard him say on that tape, um, was there anything in George's voice that gave you the impression that he was angry or acting with ill will, or spite, or hatred on that phone call? No. So since you've never heard him scream like this before, how are you certain it's his voice? I just felt it. I knew that it was him. I, I just knew it. And I saw the reaction that his wife had in listening to it. I mean, we were all together. It was definitely George. But it is your own opinion, Absolutely. separate and apart from everybody else's, that the voice you just heard was George Zimmerman screaming for help? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Nothing further, really. You were asked about the, and I'm not going to play it again, but those two things that I played, the two clips, correct? Yes. Where he uttered the, part of my language, assholes. Are you saying that that's, that he speaks that on a normal basis? I'm on saying a regular that basis? I've, I've heard him say it before. Okay. And so you're saying that when he is following somebody and he's referring to these, part of my language, these assholes always get away, he's just trying to invite them out to dinner? I don't think I said that, no. Okay, so, well, you were asked in terms of your impressions of whether it was ill will or hatred. Does it, somebody that is talking to somebody else in that manner, you think that they're like saying, hey, come on over and let's talk and let's go out to dinner? Well, I, I don't think he was angry. You don't think he was angry? Not at all. You were there that night? I was not. I only have what you have to listen to. Okay, so you're, you're speculating as to how he was feeling based on just those two terms, correct? I guess we both are. Right? I, yeah. Is that I correct? Guess so, yes. Okay. But what you're saying is that when somebody tells the police, which he's talking to, that these, pardon my language, these assholes always get away, he's not upset that in the past people have gotten away and this time they're going to get away. This time Mr. Trayvon Martin is going to get away? 
You don't take it as that? I, I don't take it as okay. he's angry, no. Okay. And um, when somebody, as Mr. Zierman did in this case, the defendant said, these fucking, pardon my language, these fucking punks, you're saying that that's a normal term that he uses? Let me object, Your Honor. Uh, foundation, uh, in that she testified. She okay, it's so a speaking, it. a speaking Sorry. objection. That's proper foundation. Okay. Um, I'll be glad to play it again, Your Honor. Okay, please do so. And the second, well, the second one would be speculation, even if it's played again. But let, let him play it again. We can get you some headphones if you need to. We can go upstairs. Go on, in a, um, under 106 request, um, in the rule of completeness, that the entire tape be played. Okay. Go ahead and play the entire tape. Do you want headphones? Yes, I want to play this part, and I'll be glad to play the entire tape, but I want to focus on this part. I, I request no a rule of, of completeness that is the entire he's, tape. He's going to do it, so okay. Thank you. I'm he sorry. said he will do it. Okay. Uh, he was straight in. Don't turn the mic off. Shit, he's running. He's running. Which way is he running? Uh, he's down towards the uh, entrance of the needle. Okay. Which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. <laughs> Okay. Did you hear him say, Mr. Zimmerman, you recognize his voice, correct? I do recognize his okay. voice. And you heard him say, pardon my language, shit, he's running, correct? I did hear that, yes. And then you could tell he's out of breath, can't you? I don't know about that. Well, you can tell his voice changes, doesn't it? It didn't, I don't think so. You want me to play it again? I've heard it three times. I don't think his voice is changing. You think he's, his voice is just constant throughout that? It seems to be to okay. me. Okay. And all we're asking you is what, <laughs> what you believe, haven't heard that. And you heard the word, pardon my language, fucking, did you not? I did not hear that, no. You don't hear fucking or you don't hear, pardon my language, punks either? I, I don't hear that. Okay, no, now sorry. we're going to play the whole recording. That's just the flower call. Uh, it's retreating circle. Um, the best address 
can get these warm weather retreat in circle. This guy looks like he's up to no good or he's on drugs or something. It's raining and he's just walking around looking about. Okay, and this guy, is he walking? He looks black. Did you see what he was wearing? Yeah, a dark hoodie, like a gray hoodie, and either jeans or sweatpants and white tennis shoes. He's sitting in the room and he's just staring. Oh, he's just walking around here at all the houses. Okay. And now he's just staring at me. Okay, so it's 1111 retreat you or 111? That's the, that's the clubhouse. That's the clubhouse. Do you know what the, he's near the clubhouse right now? Yeah, now he's coming towards me. Okay. He's got his hand in his waistband. Yeah, he's a black man. Okay. How old would you say he is? He's got a button on his shirt. Late teens. Late teens, okay. Mm hmm. Something's wrong with him. Yep. He's coming to check me out. He's got something in his hand. I don't know what his deal is. Okay, just let me know if he does anything else. Okay. Yeah, we got him on the way. Just let me know if this guy does anything else. Okay. He's an asshole. He always get away. Yeah. When you come to the cross, you come straight in and you go left. Actually, you, you go past the clubhouse. Um, it says on the left hand side from the clubhouse? And then you go in straight through the entrance and then you go left. Uh, yeah, he goes straight in, don't turn and make a left shit, he's running. He's running, which way is he running? Uh, he's down towards the, uh, entrance of the needle. Okay, which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. Okay, he's running back towards the back entrance. Yeah, he's running. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. That was the entire tape, the phone call that he made. Do you recognize the defendant's voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, you were also asked by um, Mr. O'Mara whether you, um, in terms of you being positive that the voice you heard on the other call, you want me to play that again for you? No. Okay. You recognize it as being, you believe George Zierman, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And in that call, when you heard the cries for help, correct? Yes. Did you ever hear any inter interruption at all? Did they interrupt or were they continuous cries for help? Weren't they continuous cries for help? Yes. Okay. Good to be. Thank you, Anne. Any re redirect? There is some based upon the new information presented, Your Honor. Um, 
now that you've had a chance to listen to the entirety of the phone call, I want to ask you some questions about that, okay? Okay. Um, anywhere on that call, any word, any sentence, any phrase, did you hear anything that to you, knowing George, George Zimmerman's voice as you do, um, evidenced that he was angry or acting with ill will? No. Uh, that he was spiteful in his presentation to the law enforcement officer? No. When he said things like, he looks black, did that come across to you as spiteful or hateful? No. But about when he was, right after he said the word asshole, when he was given directions to the clubhouse, you heard the word asshole, correct? Yes. And I know these are uncomfortable for you, and we're just throwing out curse words like we can, but understand that in the context of a courtroom, we live with the evidence, okay? Okay. So using that word, assholes, I think you testified that did not evidence to you any ill will or hatred? No. How about the words right afterwards when he said that, and then he said, he gave directions to the clubhouse? Did he seem exasperated or angry in that? No. When he said, shit, he's running away, then the officer asked him, where's he running? And he said, down towards the back entrance. Did that, did that language to you evidence any angry anger or hatred? No. How about when the officer asked him, are you following him? And he said, we don't need you to do that. And George said, OK. Did you hear any anger in that? No. Did you, could you identify what that, that wind noise or that sound was during that part of the conversation? No, I didn't know. When he said, um, when they were talking about where to meet, uh, and Mr. Zimmerman gave him the ad, the, his telephone number, any anger that you heard in that? No. When he said the word crap, that he had just given out his telephone number, sort of out there in the open, when he said that word crap, did it evidence any anger or, or ill will or spite or hatred to you? No. And how about right after you used that word when he just said, yeah, I'll meet you at the mailboxes or no, call me. Did you hear anything in his voice that gave you an idea that he was getting upset or that he was angry at anybody, never mind the person who may have been um, him talking about? No, I didn't. And Mrs. Mr. Delayonda asked you whether or not those screams were continuous, and you said you thought so? Yeah. Did they seem to be scream? Time, scream, time, scream, time, or, or, was it, or, which okay. is the alternative. Okay. Rephrase your question. May I give an alternative, which? Rephrase your question. Okay. Um, did you hear gaps between the screams, gaps in time between the screams? Um. Let me ask it this way. Was that one? long, continu continuous scream without any stopping, or was it individual screams? I don't think it was long and continuous, but there were a lot of cries for help. Okay. A lot of separate cries? Objection, please. Sustained. Nothing further than your honor. Okay, thank you. May Ms. Osterman be excused? Yes, your honor. Yes, all. Thank you very much. You may be excused. You. Call your next witness, please. Defense is called Mark Osterman, Your Honor. We swear or affirm that the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. State your name. 
Mark Osterman. And of course, you've testified before the court in this case before, correct? Yes, sir. Last I week. think you were placed under oath again, but you certainly acknowledge that you still or are presently under oath as you testified before the jury? Yes, sir. Okay. And I know that we don't go very far into your background, and I know that it was talked about before, but you are a federal air marshal? I am. Lived your life within the confines of law enforcement? Is that correct? I have. Okay. And um, you do know George Zimmerman, obviously? I do. What I'd like to focus your attention on a couple of subjects, first of which is um, any information you have regarding Mr. Zimmerman accomplishing a concealed weapons permit. Are you aware of that process? I am. And if you would, tell the jury what discussions you had with Mr. Zimmerman in that regard. Objection calls for here, sir. Go ahead. In reference to the concealed weapons permit, um, we had talked about him getting a concealed weapons permit and how to go about it. Uh, there was a local uh, sports store, I think it was Gander Mountain, that was putting on a class for the concealed weapons permit, and uh, he, uh, he had signed up for it, him and his wife, and they both took the class together where it provided training and, uh, and the actual fingerprinting and other things. <coughs> And did you have um, discussions with him about gun safety? Often. Uh, we, had, we had gone to a shooting range on several occasions, probably eight or ten occasions. And each time, uh, firearm safety is, was always, always at the first or the top of our list of discussions. And generally speaking, tell the jury what you mean by firearm safety. Well, uh, firearm safety at a range means always being safe and and aware of where your firearm is being pointed, making sure that it's, uh, it's in a safe condition until you're ready to fire it, or if it's uh, not being pointed in a direction that shouldn't be pointed, and uh, uh, just making sure that it's, it's handled correctly. And, uh, and George was, was very safe all the time. And that was in part based upon your instruction to him? That is possible. And um, did you discuss with him the type of weapon to purchase and the purpose for it? Yes, we did. And if um, you would explain to the jury about that. Well, there are many different types of firearms purposes. Uh, some are for competition. If you wish to compete and travel and, and compete in firearms competitions, you would use a certain type of firearm for that. Some are for, for self-defense, um, and those would be a little more compact, a little smaller, able to, to keep on your person with a concealed weapons permit. Some, of course, would just be for, let's say, home defense, and they may be a little larger in size. But uh, for the ones that you would have for personal defense, those would probably be the ones that uh, I recommended George to get if he was going to get a concealed weapons permit. And uh, the type of firearm that we chose was the Caltech 9mm, and uh, it was chosen for the reason of it didn't have an exterior safety. Uh, when you have an exterior safety on a firearm, it's, sometimes it can be dangerous to the person who owns the firearm, such as if you need to use it in a very stressful situation, uh, sometimes your mind will lock up a bit, will not allow you to think that extra step of pulling the safety down before you need to use it to defend yourself. So as most law enforcement agencies or all that I'm aware of, they, uh, they don't have an exterior safety on your firearm, which means there's no extra button to push. The, the only natural safety that you would have is an extended uh, trigger pull. It means the trigger is not what, what people sometimes call a hair trigger. It's an extended trigger pull to where it can't be just accidentally squeezed and have the firearm go off. What were the um, characteristics then of the Caltech 9 that you focused on in assisting Mr. Zimmerman to purchase that weapon for self-defense? Um, it's a reliable firearm. Um, it, is, it is without the exterior safety. And uh, some, some firearms have two or three exterior types of safeties. Uh, I was not a fan of those. And so our discussion went to the type of firearm to where if you're, uh, ironically enough, we had this discussion, if you're in a tussle with someone and, and you need to utilize a there's a situation that's so stressful that you can't think to remove one or two exterior safeties and you just you need to you need to protect yourself and you need to do it right now the the Caltech was the was the type of weapon that was was good and, for him. 
I understand I'm not supposed to ask you what weapon you carry for work, so I won't. But can I ask you whether or not it has an external safety? Every law enforcement uh, job I've ever had, none have ever had an exterior safety. And is the then extended trigger pull uh, a safety choice for those type of firearms? Absolutely, and that is by design. Um, did you give any or have any conversations with Mrs. Zimmerman as to how to keep the firearm, whether it be in a loaded position, unloaded position, or how that would be then ready for use if necessary? Um, I would have, I suggested that you keep one loaded in the chamber because some people, if you're in your home and you have, let's say, children at your home, uh, that obviously you should not have contact with it, but if an accident happens and it happens to be left somewhere, not having one in the chamber might be the smarter option to where someone would actually have to manually manipulate the, the firearm, the automatic firearm, to put around in the chamber to allow it to be, to be fired. Um, if you're in a situation where you're walking around day to day and you have it in a concealed weapons capacity, having one in the chamber is something that has to be done because if you absolutely need to use it to protect someone else in society or yourself, um, it would, it would, that extra step sometimes is the difference between life and death. Do you keep around chambered in your gun? All the time. And do you know any law enforcement agencies that would suggest that that's inappropriate to do? It's against policy. To? Not have one in the chamber. And um, did you have any discussions regarding having a full magazine after chambering one? And what's that concept? Well, the suggestion I made to George was uh, we had talked about that and how uh, he had heard that by not adding the extra mat, the round in the magazine, did something to the spring. It kind of maybe compressed the spring down too long. And maybe firearms that were made back in the, back in the 70s or 80s, the springs weren't made of as good a material. So the spring had what was known as a memory. But in today's firearms, especially with the Caltech, there is no reason I can think of why you wouldn't, after loading a round into the chamber, why you wouldn't add another into the magazine in case you needed that. There's, there's no reason why not to have that. To leave an extra available round uh, not in your firearm just didn't seem to make sense. And um, you've had an opportunity to be with Mr. Zimmerman when he was at the drive firing range? Often. Um, what hand does he shoot his firearm with? He, he shoots, he shoots right-handed, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I, if I remember correctly, he is, he's left-handed when he writes. Okay. But his firearm, he shoots with, what, first of all, when you hold a firearm, obviously, do you use two hands if you can? And if so, which dominant hand would you use? Well, the hand that squeezes the trigger would be your, the dominant hand. And I believed he was right-handed when he fired his firearm. And so the right hand would be holding the, the firearm and then of course the right index finger is what pulls the trigger. If there was evidence, and you may not be aware of it, of the gun being on his right side, um, what would be the normal process for removing the holster from the firearm um, to fire it? Objection, this is speculation. Sustained. Um, do you know of any training which would suggest sort of the cross-body um, presentation, going across one side and bringing it out rather than going up and out. Are you aware of that? Absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the objection? The relevance as to this case. Please not. Um, it's sustained. Um, did you have discussions with Mr. Zimmerman as to how and where to maintain his firearm in a concealed way? Uh, my discussions with him for anything firearm related like that was do what is comfortable, do what feels uh, uh, most natural because if a stressful situation is thrust upon you, you're going to always go back to what, what feels natural and what you've trained with. So is it then important in, the, in your discussions with Mr. Zimmerman that um, he have consistency in how he handles his firearm? Absolutely.
can you recall any time where you see Mr. Zimmerman use his left hand as a dominant hand for shooting a firearm? Yes. Tell me about that. We've um, we practiced that. Sometimes if you're unable to shoot with your dominant hand or the hand that you're most comfortable shooting with, shoot with the other hand. Uh, sometimes you do it just for marksmanship practice and sometimes you do it in case your primary dominant hand gets injured, your arm gets broken in, in, in some kind of event, you may need to use your left hand or the alternate hand for that reason. And that would be used then as an alternative method of the use of the firearm? Whichever hand can get to the firearm, that's the one you would use. Um, and as you testified before, you've known Mrs. Zimmerman for how long? Uh, at least five years. And I believe that your wife had met him first? She did. Through work? She did. Okay. Um, have you had an opportunity then to interact with Mr. Zimmerman over the past five years? Um, I think you testified that he's your best friend, correct? He is. Um, have you heard his voice then in different varying situations or experiences? I have. And um, just an overview of sort of the different um, types of voice, conversational, laughing, whatever it might be, as sort of the the spectrum of what you've heard Mrs. Zimmerman and his voice sound like? Quite a bit, quite, quite wide in the spectrum. Okay, can you give us any examples? Um, well, the, anywhere from the, the casual conversation to the hysterical laugh uh, to, uh, to perhaps uh, shouts over long distance, uh, someone's downrange at the shooting range or someone is at the other side of a store and yelling to each other, but um, Perhaps not what I had heard on the 911 tapes. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, if I might play for you a tape, I believe it's 158. I'm getting that right? Yes. Uh, may I play that exhibit at this point? I'm going to play um, an exhibit for you, which I think you reference as the 911 call, and ask first that we you listen through it. Throughout, if you need to hear it a second time, let me know. If you need me to go back and listen to a portion, let me know if I'm going to play it straight through one time. Nine on one, do you need police fire medical? Um, maybe both. I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. Okay, what's the address that they're near? Twelve Eleven Twin Trees Lane. Twin Trees Lane. Is this in the Twin Lake Town homes in Sanford? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and is it a male or a female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why. I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. Just send someone quick, please. Okay. Does he look hurt? <laughs> I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So they're sending him. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right, what is your <laughs> I'm going to stop at that point. Um, have you listened to the tape throughout the end of it at any point? I have. Um, any relevance of the rest of the tape as far as your ability to hear George's voice? No, sir. Okay. Then let me focus you on what we have heard and tell the jury, um, first of all, if you have an opinion as to whose voice that is in the background, and by that I mean not who we now know to be Miss Lauer talking to the not one operator, but the screaming or the noise in the background. Do you have an opinion whose voice that is? I thought it was George. Okay. And tell me why you think that. Um, just the tone, the uh, uh, just the, the the volume and the tone of, of what I was hearing was something that because I I talked to him probably as much on the phone or had before this incident as I did in person. So hearing his voice over a over a recording is something that you, your tone's a little different and it just sounds a little different over a phone and it just sounded like George. I might have a moment, Your Honor. Yes, I have a question or two um, just concerning the decision regarding the Caltech. Um, can you explain to the jury your understanding of double action versus single action guns? Of course. Um, a firearm that has double action requires the, the trigger and the hammer to do two separate things, uh, two separate motions. One is as you're squeezing the trigger, 
the hammer was in front, was forward, it has to come back, that's the one action, and then it, then it comes forward and fires the firing pin, which sets off the firearm. A uh, single action would mean the firearm is, the, the hammer mechanism is back, and one, as you squeeze the trigger, it does one action, which is single. Now there are some automatic handguns that are single action, or I'm sorry, double action only, to where internally, the hammer is internal, so you really can't see the hammer coming back, but both functions are done in a double action capacity. And is a Caltech 9 the type firearm where it could only be double action? Correct. Is That's that what a makes the extra trigger squeeze even harder, and, and it's, it's more of a firm squeeze, uh, making it less likely to go off by accident. And is that one of the safety features of that gun? It's its, it's greatest safety feature. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further on Thank you, Cross. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Osterman. And good morning, sir. Um, I think we briefly talked about the book last time. You did write a book with your wife, right? Correct. And all the proceeds are going on behalf of George Zerman. Is that, that correct? That is correct. Okay. How many books have been sold so far? I'm not sure. Tate Publishing would probably know best. Okay. They would probably give us the best best number. But whatever money has been uh, obtained so far, you're setting it aside for the defendant George Zimmerman, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, you were asked, I guess, at the very end about uh, the knowledge of the gun that you suggested to Mr. Zimmerman, correct, the defendant? Correct. Okay. Do you know what the trigger pull is on that gun? Uh, the pounds per square inch, is that what yeah. you're referring? Yeah. I do not know. Would you agree that an expert uh, uh, with firearms would be better suited to explain the mechanics of that? and the trigger pull and all that stuff? Without question. You're not here testifying as a firearms expert? I am right? not. Okay, I just wanna make sure the record was clear about that. Correct. Uh, but you did state that you did have discussions with the defendant, Mr. Zimmerman, regarding uh, what type of gun he should have, and you, I think you taught him how to shoot, correct? It's my recollection, right? He had been shooting at a range before his father was career military, so he, he this, I was not his first time going to a shooting range. But you, you made him a better shooter? I hope so. Okay. And um, you mentioned in terms of discussions with him in terms of the firearm, what to get. Yes, he sir. never conferred with you as the type of holster to get, correct? Uh, he did not. Right? I mean, the holster he got, he got on his own, correct? Correct. And um, did he ever show it to you once he got it? Oh, yes. That it was an internal holster? Correct. Right? And an internal means you, you can hide it inside your, your waistband versus an external, which is what the police would have if they're in uniform, et cetera, correct? Absolutely. Is, is that the difference? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so it'd be hard to see, in other words. Internally, it, people would be having a hard time seeing it. Correct? correct. That's the whole purpose. Even without a jacket, that would be difficult to see. Okay. And if it was dark, it would be even harder to see, correct? I would agree. Okay. And um, you were talking about techniques in terms of shooting the gun and all that, in terms of shooting. I gather when you were shooting with him, in terms of you shoot at a target, you shoot to, to aim to kill, correct? You aim center mass, center of the target. Center mass, meaning the heart, the, the torso, correct? That is absolutely correct. And, and you keep shooting until the threat is, is gone. In other words, if the person's still alive and all that, you keep shooting until the threat is gone, correct? Well, it's not so much as if the person is still alive, it's until the threat is neutralized. Right. In other words, you would never holster your gun if the person was still alive and was a threat to you, correct? Well. I, I disagree with that. Uh, I you would, would? I would disagree. My, my thought would be that the minute someone, let's say someone was a threat to me uh, with a knife or a firearm, uh, mm. even if they had the, the knife in their hand but they surrendered and went and started following my instructions, I would, I would consider them neutralized. Okay. In that scenario, if there's still a threat, you would keep shooting, correct? Not if they're not aggressively harming you. Okay, so you would holster the gun if you felt the person had a firearm still? I have enough confidence to know that I might be able to retrieve it fast enough if they jump back at me. You're saying that you shoot somebody and you still feel they have a gun and they're going for the gun that you would, you would holster your gun? Not if they're going after my gun. If, no. if they're going, if you believe they have a gun or they have some type of weapon. If their hands are free? Yeah, and you can't see their hands. Oh, then I would keep the firearm out. You would keep the firearm pointed at the person, right? Probably. Or, or, and or shoot because you thought it was a threat. Uh, you'd only shoot if you felt the actual threat of, of a firearm. 
So okay. If firearm pointed in your direction, then you would you would fire again until it's neutralized. So let's make sure the question is clear. In other words, if you feel the person has some kind of weapon, you would not holster your gun, correct? It it would depend. If you can't see the, the person's hands and they, you believe they have some kind of weapon, you would not holster your gun. It would it would depend. Um, it would depend on the type of weapon. Okay. Well, if you can't tell it what type of weapon they have, but you believe they have some kind of weapon, they're a threat to you. Would you holster your gun? Well, I'm a person that would, would give police commands and give that kind of uh, commanding presence. And if someone's not obeying the commands right on the heels of a, a very stressful and, and, and physical confrontation, um, I would probably keep the firearm out. Uh, that's, that may be what I would do with the training I've had. Yes, sir. And you talked about the gun in terms of how many uh, rounds. I guess technically people refer to it as bullets, but you know it's actually referred to as a round, and then there's, the bullet is the part that comes out of the gun, right? So just make sure the jury understands. Good distinction. Okay, and you got the cartridge, et cetera, and you got right. the gunpowder. But you're saying that you would fully load and have one in the chamber already? Always. Right? There's no reason now, not to. You're saying that that's per policy. You're talking about police officers. Police officer policy in, in every department I've ever right. worked now, with. There is a distinction. You're not telling every citizen is when they get a permit, they're told automatically that they have to Absolutely have a gun not. in the chamber. Not at all. You're talking about police officers. Correct. There's a difference, right? I agree. Now, you're talking about in terms of scenarios that you discussed with, with the defendant. Yes. You were asked about that. If the person, if you shot at somebody, right, and you didn't realize whether you had shot him or not, <laughs> The person said, "Gave up, give up." What would you do if they still were a threat to you? If they were still a threat? Yeah. Would you shoot them then? Uh, could you define what the threat might be? Well, I'm just talking about what the scenarios you discussed with the defendant. Well, what we discussed was if they're a threat. Let's say someone lays down on the ground and, and follows your commands. That you tell them to freeze, get down to their knees, lay down on the ground. You're not a threat at that point. At that point, I would probably try to restrain them. Okay. And so you discussed with them in terms of taking somebody, in terms of arresting them or, hand, or uh, getting them under control, correct? Uh, if we did, it was something I, I wouldn't have remembered the specifics of it. Uh, he, would not have, he would not have needed to know how to arrest somebody or how to, how to restrain someone. It was basically if someone is a threat to yourself or, or to someone in the general public, uh, you keep the firearm out if they're an active threat. That Caltech gun that we talked about, when you fire it, it you intend that bullet to go out the gun, right? Out the barrel, right? There's no like, you don't like kind of in the mood. Squeeze the trigger a little bit. When you're squeezing, you're intending for that bullet to go out, correct? Right, correct. And make sure the record's clear now, you're not saying that Mr. Zirin was a law enforcement officer. Not at all. Okay. Unlike you, obviously, Correct. there's a difference, right? I agree. Wouldn't you agree? 100%. A big difference. I agree. In terms of what police officers can do and what a citizen can do. The authority right? is much different. Correct. And I'm assuming if, if in terms of the scenarios you discuss with them, if you're confronting a person, in other words, when they're saying they're giving up, they're backing up, you don't shoot them, right? Correct. I'm assuming. Or, or do you? Does the police te teach no. you to shoot them? No. Okay. You mentioned about left-handed, right-handed. Did you say that he had shot the gun left-handed? Did I we, understand we you correctly? We had practiced both. So he was proficient in shooting it left-handed, but right was his dominant hand? Uh, proficient is a relative word. Um, could, he sh could he pull the trigger and hit the target? Absolutely. I wouldn't consider that proficient. It's just familiar. Okay. So he could shoot the, tr uh, the, the, the gun and hit the target with his left hand? Left or right-handed. Okay. But he was better right-handed than left-handed. Would that be fair? I thought so. Okay. I have a moment, Your Thank you, sir. Have a nice Thank you. Bye.
Can you redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Just so we're clear with the different authority with police officers and citizens. Um, in order for a gun to be available for self-defense, it has to be ready to fire, correct? Always. I would, I would highly recommend that. So if you were asked by anybody, including Mrs. Zimmerman, how to keep a gun so that it, if necessary, it's available for self-defense, what would you tell them about chambering a load or not? Putting a round in the chamber and then what is called topping off the magazine because the magazine is where the, the bullets are. As you place that into an automatic handgun, you take one off the top and it goes into the chamber. Well, I would recommend removing the magazine, putting one more bullet into the magazine, putting it back in there because it's always better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And that goes not only for law enforcement that you're more familiar with, but for citizens as well, correct? My wife has a concealed weapons permit and I instruct her the same way. When you say <clears throat> the training for firearms includes focusing on center of mass, what does that mean? Um, firearms in, uh, at the range, uh, to shoot firearms at a target, at a paper target, is difficult. It's almost like a golf swing where you need to do many things correctly, and if any one of them isn't correct, then you're, you're off of your target. So you try to concentrate on doing everything correctly, but uh, in a stressful situation, to aim at a particular point, such as, uh, I guess in, in, in Hollywood, they sometimes shoot, they shoot for the shoulder or something of that nature. That is such a small area that if you feel threatened, you aim for the largest area that you can get to stop the threat, to remove the threat. And um, is there any training from your experience that um, if you're going to do that, that you shoot more than once? or that you shoot rapid succession, or how is that handled? Uh, we, we have that training. Um, they also train that type of technique at, uh, at concealed weapons permit classes to fire more than once, uh, either the two shot or the three shot. Um, it, it depends on the scenario, depends on the situation. It would depend on uh, whether you have multiple assailants that are, that are threatening you, something to that effect. What's then the purpose for shooting more than once and going for center of mass? Um, well, if you have a smaller caliber handgun, um, the impact of the projectile isn't, isn't as, as great. Um, if you have a, a rather large person, uh, someone over six foot five or something very, uh, very heavy in, in their weight, uh, shooting a smaller caliber bullet may not have the same effect to stop them someone who is also uh, perhaps under uh, a narcotic that is enhancing their strength. Uh, sometimes firing once may not stop them from being a threat and they may continue to attack. We had talked, uh, you had talked with Mr. Delionda about the internal holster that you were not there when that was chosen? Correct, correct. correct. But that you've seen it? I have. Is there something um, sinister or improper in your mind about an internal holster? No, it's comfort. Um, uh, you, you wear what is comfortable to you and you wear what is, uh, what's going to be effective. Uh, you don't, there's, there's some holsters that some people will get that are uh, more for show, but they're, they're kind of difficult to remove the firearm. And sometimes you see that at a shooting range where someone is trying to get their, their firearm out of the holster and it's, it's a struggle. Always go with what's comfortable and what's functional. So just so we're clear, if I had a holster with the gun, the internal holster has the gun if my fingers are the gun. The internal holster, if I might approach the witness for a moment. The internal holster sort of holds the gun in here, correct? I would think, yes. Hidden from view, correct? Uh, it's design, correct. In effect, concealed. Yes. The purpose of a concealed weapons permit is to allow you to do what? Is to make sure no one can see it. That is, that's, I think that's the law of Florida's concealed weapons permit, is not to carry it open. Of course, carrying one external would have it like this, correct? You would be required then to have a jacket or right. some kind of cover. So that if I had an external holster like this, this might be legal, correct? I would agree. This wouldn't be legal, would it? 
That would be a violation. And this certainly would not be legal. Mm, absolutely not. But with an internal holster, I might get away with having a legal carry as long as the gun was not visible. Correct. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Truman. Thank you. Very briefly, Your Honor. You, you mentioned in terms of the, uh, that you shoot more than once, it's called a double tap, I believe, right? Yes, sir, it is. In terms of, if the threat is still existing, you're shooting not just once, you're shooting twice, or three times, however many times, correct? Correct. And normally it's twice. Well, we, we practice that. All right. Over Thank and over you. and over. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. May Mr. Osterman be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you very much, sir. You are excused. Call your next witness, please. Yes, subject to recall. Jury, Your Honor. Um, you're subject to being recalled, sir. Defense recall, Jerry Russo, Your Honor. I swear or affirm that the testimony you give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I hope yes. you got. You may proceed. Thank you, Mom. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. You? State your name, please. Jerry Russo. And the last name is spelled R U S S O? Yes. And where do you work? I'm sorry, Jerry is? G-E-R-I. That's probably the more difficult one. There's probably more variations. And where do you work? I work for Digital Risk. And what type of company is that? Uh, Digital Risk does uh, reviews of defaulted mortgages and also origination mortgages. And how long have you lived there? Uh, I've lived been... there. How long have you worked there? <laughs> I've been there most recently for about a year and a half. And I've worked there previously in the past also for just over a year, but I had a, about a year's gap in employment. Okay. And do you know George Zimmerman? I do. And how do you know him? I worked with George at Digital Risk. Okay. Was that then during that first one-year period that you worked at Digital Risk or it, more recently? It was both times. Okay. Correct. And then Mrs. Zimmerman was there while you were there. You left for a little while. He still worked there. You came back and he was still working. That's there. correct. Okay. And would you consider yourself a friend of George Zimmerman's? Yes, I do. Okay. And also, obviously, a co-worker? Yes. Okay. Even um, during the year that you weren't working there, would you keep in touch with George, Mr. Zimmerman? Yes, we do okay. keep in touch. Did you know his wife as well? I did not know her personally, no. But yet you kept in touch with George Zimmerman even for that year that you weren't working there. Yes. And when you came back then, would you all, how often would you see him on a weekly basis? Uh, I would say sometimes daily or several times a week. It just varied, but quite often. Okay. Have an, inter have an ability to then to interact with him on almost a daily basis? Yes. Hear his voice? Yes. And... Um, if you can tell us, if you can, um, we're sort of using the term sort of a spectrum of different voices, anything from conversational tone, um, yelling, laughing. You sort of tell us, to the extent that you've heard him speak um, in different ways, tell us about that. Um, you know, normal conversation, um, Personal conversation, work conversation. Um, I've heard him speak in English. I've heard him speak in Spanish. You've heard him um, laughing or yelling? I've heard him laughing, not yelling. Okay. 
And my understanding is, of course, you know why we're here, the event that happened on February 26th of 2012, correct? Yes. And um, you had, uh, did you speak to him just after that event? It wasn't just after that event, but it, it was in sometime in the year after that. I couldn't be exactly sure okay. what you, day. Okay, do you recall, um, if you can, how uh, far after or long after the event of the shooting that you spoke with him? My best estimate would be a couple of months okay. before he returned to Seminole County. Okay, that's when he was out of Seminole County before he came back? Yes. yes. Have you um, had an opportunity to listen to what we're calling the Lauer 911 call, the yes, tape? Um, I'm going to play it for you and um, let me know if you have an opinion as to whose voice it is, okay? Yes. I might have just a moment, Your Honor. I'm going to play it one time straight through. If you want me to play it a second time, let me know. And if you want me to go back to a particular portion of it, let me know, okay? Okay. 911, do you need police, fire, medical? Um, maybe both. I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. Okay, what's the address that they're near? 1211 Twin Trees Lane. Twin Trees Lane? Is this in the Twin Lake Town, Tom's and Sanford? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and is it a male or a female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why. I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. Just send someone quick, say stop. Okay. Does he look hurt to you? I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So they're sending. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right, what is your issue on the Gunshot. Have you heard that tape before? Yes, I have. If you would tell the jury um, how many times or when and circumstances. I've heard it uh, less than half a dozen times and mostly on the TV news. The first time I heard it was on the news. Okay. And were you able, well, first of all, do you have an opinion as to whose voice that is? Yes. And whose voice is that? And let me premise it this. We know that we hear someone in the foreground, a person by the name of Ms. Lau, who's talking to the 911 operator. Mm -hmm. uh, could you hear the um, noise or the yelling in the background? Yes, I could. Can you identify whose voice that was yelling in the background? George's. Okay, and how do you know that? I recognize his voice. I've heard him speak many times. I have no doubt in my mind that's his voice. Um, you said that you heard the tape several times. Was that mainly uh, listening to it on TV? Yes. Were you able to identify Mr. Zimmerman's voice during the very first time that you listened to it? Yes. My immediate reaction was, that's George's voice. Was anyone there prompting you in any way to identify the voice as one particular person over another? No. Is this just something that you listen to on TV by yourself or with family members? Or? I was in my home. I think the background the first time they played it, and I believe I was by myself. <coughs> if I might have a moment. Or Thank you, Cross. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Ms. Russo, actually, you would characterize yourself as a good friend of the defendants, correct? A good friend, a work friend. Well, but you and he would communicate outside of work as well, true? Occasionally, yes. You would text him? Occasionally, yes. He would yes. text you back? Occasionally, yes. Tell the members of the jury, if you would, 
When's the first time you heard that tape that was just played for you? You said you heard it on the news. My question is when? When? Uh, I would say soon after it was initially released to the media. Do you recall what month that was? I do not. You understood at that time that George Zimmerman was under investigation for the murder of Trayvon Martin? I don't know at the point that I heard the tape that he was under investigation, no. He wasn't at work, was he? No. Where'd you think he was? Uh, all I knew is that he was out of work. You, you had no idea that he was being no, I investigated didn't, um, about the murder of Well, let me clarify. Martin? You're asking, I knew about the incident that occurred, but as far as whether he was under any type of particular investigation, I recall at the particular moment that I heard that on the news that there was a active investigation. If I said I knew that or I didn't know that, I'd be guessing. Why did you think he wasn't at work? What, initially, I thought he was out sick. Then I heard he was out on FMLA. But, but you're telling this jury you had no idea he was being investigated for that murder? No, I'm not telling them that. I'm saying at the time that I heard the 911 call on the news, I can't recall at this moment if I knew at that very moment that he was under investigation. If I said that I knew that, I'm just guessing. Okay. The assumption is that yes, he was, why else would it be on the news? But I would just be guessing. All right, but you knew at the time you heard the tape that he had shot Trayvon Martin? Yes. Okay. And you know now he's actually charged with the second degree murder of Trayvon Martin? Yes, of course I do. So when you heard the tape, you wanted to believe it was George Zimmerman's voice screaming for help? No, when I heard the tape, my immediate reaction was that's George screaming for help. Did you want to believe it was Trayvon Martin? There wasn't a matter of believing or wanting to believe who it was. I recognized it to be George's voice. But you've never heard him yell before, right? No, I have not. Never heard him scream? No. So you don't know what he sounds like when he screams, do you? No, but the voice I recognized was that of George Zimmerman's. Did you ever hear Trayvon Martin speak? No, I have not. Did you ever hear, hear him yell? No, I have not. So you have no idea what Trayvon Martin sounds no, like when I he do yells, not. do you? No. <coughs> Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Dora. Thank you. I'm very, very grateful, Your Honor. You understand now that he was actually out of Mr. Zimmerman was out of state just shortly after the shooting, correct? Yes. Objected as calling for speculation. I unless think you you're on a well, it would be sustained unless she knows. Okay. Do you know? Well, I don't know how to ask it without asking it, so I will. Did you know uh, where Mr. Zimmerman was just after the shooting? I didn't know his exact location, but I knew he was not in the state of Florida. You knew that he had to leave the state? Yes. Okay. And that at first there was um, police investigation, correct? I believe so, yes, okay. there was a shooting. And that um, he was not charged with a crime um, immediately, was he? Judge, don't object to that again unless she has that information. I'm just asking to rephrase the question. Rephrase I'll rephrase it. Do you know when, how long it was before charges were filed against him? I believe it was a couple of months. Okay, so you know that he was not charged initially by the police, correct? Correct. And that he wasn't charged until the Fourth Circuit came down from Jacksonville and charged him? Judge, again, I object to leave. Sustained. Do you know who charged him with second degree murder? I don't know exactly who charged him, but I know he was charged. Do you know whether or not the 18th Judicial Circuit, this circuit, charged him? I believe there was a special prosecutor involved. You were asked when the first time was. Um, question, I think he asked you the question, didn't you really want it to be George? Weren't you hopeful that it was George Zimmerman screaming? And what was your answer? I just immediately recognized it as George's voice. There was no hoping it was one person or the other. And you understand that you're under oath as you sit here today, yes, correct? Yes, I do. Um, are you, um, is your friendship with Mr. Zimmerman um, any hopes you may have as to the outcome of this case? Is that affecting your testimony here today? Absolutely not. If you, if it was your opinion 
that it was not George Zimmerman's voice on the tape, would you testify to that as well? Yes, I would. Thank you, nothing further. Thank you. Um, may Ms. Russo be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Excuse. Please call your next witness. What suggested time for the morning break if we're going to take ones? Do you, do you all need a break? Ladies and gentlemen. Defer to them. Okay. They're good. Call your next witness, please. <coughs> solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you. may proceed. Thank you. Morning, ma'am. How are you? Good morning. Um, state your name, please. Leanne. Benjamin. Okay. And are you married? Yes, I am. To whom? John Donnelly. Okay. And do you know George Zimmerman? Yes, I do. And if you would, tell the jury how long you've known him. I think I met George for the first time either at the end of 2002 or early in 2003. And if you would briefly tell the jury what the circumstances of that. Uh, I own and operate a local real estate business, and George was working for a local insurance company, and I used to refer my customers over to him, so I got to know him that way. Okay. Um, would a characterization of it as a business friendship be appropriate? Yes, it started out as a business relationship. Okay. And was that... Have you maintained then a friendship sort of continuously since back in 2002? Yes. And if you would just tell the jury sort of the, the high points of that, how it happened and how okay. it progressed. Well, and, and I'm I, sorry, do you know Shelby Zimmerman as well? Yes, I do. And, and when I have you talk to the jury about the relationship, is it one that grew with you and your husband and George, and his, George Zimmerman and his wife? Yes. Okay. So as you're going through this, you're talking about sort of the relationship that grew between the four of you? Yes. Okay, if you would. Mostly, uh, it started out, though, just with George. Okay. George. Not using the surname. Um, one thing that I didn't talk to you about beforehand, <laughs> uh, in a courtroom, we have to be very careful with the record, so we need to use full names. So even though he may be known to you more familiarly, um, if he would use his entire name, George Zimmerman or Mr. Zimmerman, I would appreciate it, as with the court. Okay. Okay. So if you would, using um, his name, tell us. Well, I first met George Zimmerman through the real estate business that I was doing, and I would refer <coughs> my customers uh, to his, the company he was working with, and um, we got to know each other with the business relationship that way first. And my office is in the same building where his office was, and we kept the refrigerator there and offered people to come for uh, soda or something. And uh, Mr. Zimmerman did that on numerous occasions. Um, then he began asking me questions about uh, business. How do you start a business? Uh, what's involved? 
what does it take to get going, things like that. So I took more interest in him then too uh, because of that. He seemed to uh, have a very keen interest in business and how to start one up. Okay. And then did that friendship progress? Are we now talking about the 2002, 3, 4 period of time? Yes. Yes, it did. And we did things more socially. Uh, we would go out to lunch or to dinner. And about that time, uh, a friend, a mutual friend, was interested in getting into politics in the city of Lake Mary. And uh, my husband and I were helping him on his campaign. And Mr. Zimmerman was also interested in the political aspects. And then we served on the campaign together. Okay. So was that sort of another connection that you and, and your husband and George Zimmerman and Shelby Zimmerman had through their work on the campaign? Yes. Okay. Um, and then just sort of move forward, get us closer towards your relationship over the last few years? Well, um, the, the relationship of the last few years has been a little more intermittent, but when you have a good friend and you don't get to see them constantly, I think everyone has relationships like that where you, you don't talk for a while, but when you see each other, it's like you pick up where you left off. And it was very comfortable. Um, my dad moved in with us and was ill and in the hospital a lot. Did that take then a lot of your focus away from friendships and focused on your dad? Yes. Okay. Did the um, friendship then sort of reemerge or, or come back um, once this event happened with Mr. Zimmerman? Actually, before. Okay. Uh, my husband and I uh, recognized that Mr. Zimmerman had a strong interest in business and with his age at the time we encouraged him to potentially go to college. We, we wanted him to consider that um, because we, at least I felt, there would be time later to do a business. So when I learned that he was uh, interested in school and going back to school, then that the friendship picked up more okay. again then. And was that when um, he had gone to Seminole State College and was in legal studies? Yes. Did you encourage that um, sort of maneuver towards education? Yes. And my, uh, my background before real estate was in teaching. So education is a love that I have. And I did a lot of volunteer work um, with respect to that. And I realized that George was uh, tutoring some young children, and I encouraged that. And I was very proud of him for that. Okay. And. Um leading us up to sort of um, what happened that brings us all here today. Um, you knew what happened with Mr. Zimmerman being involved in the shooting? I, I do now, but I didn't at the time. I did not hear about it or notice the news because my dad was having a very difficult time medically. And I was spending a lot of time with him. So I was not paying attention okay. a lot. At some point along the way between February 26th and today, though, you became aware of what Mrs. Zimmerman is going through with his second degree murder charges here. Yes. Okay. He called me, and we spoke on the telephone for quite some time. I was not aware when he had called me that the event had happened. and. I was not aware of any of the conditions or surroundings. So when we spoke on I spoke to him as my friend, and we just talked. Okay. And do you recall approximately when that first conversation occurred? 
Well. And I'll premise it with this. The asking of a question doesn't suggest there has to be an answer. Yes, so I the don't fact know. That if you don't know, and, and that's okay, um, if you can give us the year, the season, or not. It was within a couple weeks. After the event? After the event. Okay. He had tried to call me uh, before that, and I, I said, please excuse me, but I ha I'm taking care of my dad. So I couldn't talk. He tried. And then we finally did get to talk. Okay. And um, at some point then, did the friendship sort of reemerge again because of what Mrs. Zimmerman was going through? Yes. And um, I know from other sources that you have helped Mrs. Zimmerman out um, generally. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Explain to the jury about that. Well, it was very important to me to offer my support to him and I wanted to do what I could to help him. Mostly we just talked. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, have you and your husband even helped him out financially? Yes. And explain to the jury about that. Um, my husband uh, noticed his website and donated some money. Um, we have on occasion taken them some food. And, uh, my, my husband uh, took him down to the house and got him some clothes. And that was in preparation of the trial, correct? Correct. He's probably wearing one of the jackets right now? Yes, I think so. Um, would that connection to the Zimmerman family affect how you testify here today at all? I, I don't think so. I, I don't, no, I don't believe so because I just believe in telling what I know. Okay. Um, there have been um, a lot made about a 911 call to a woman we now know as Ms. Lauer. Have you ever had an opportunity to listen to that phone call? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, do you have an opinion as to whose voice it is that you hear in the background? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm going to play it for you and then um, tell me, first of all, if you want me to replay it, if um, you need me to stop and go back or whatever may need to be done, okay? I have a moment, Your Honor. This yes, security is just taking its time. Nine on one, do you need police fire medical? Um, maybe both. I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. That they're near. 1211 Twin Trees Lane. Twin Trees Lane? Is this in the Twin Lake Town Tom's in Sanford? Yes. Okay. And is it a male or female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why. I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. This friend from looks like say crap. Okay. Does he look hurt? You? I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So they're sending. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right, what is your name? <laughs> just, there's gunshots. You just... Have you listened to that before today? Yes, I have. Um, any reason for me to play any more of it or to no. go back over it? No. Um, do you have an opinion as to whose voice that is in the background? Yes, I do. And whose voice is it? George Zimmerman's voice. And how do you know that? We've spent a lot of, or had an occasion to get together many times. Uh, I know his voice, but also when we were working on the political campaign, we were loud and waving signs and just kind of hooping it up. And so I know what his voice 
sounds like when he gets excited or uh, loud. I'm gonna have a moment. Here. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Thank you, Prof. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Um, you and your husband have contributed, I believe, $2,500 on behalf of, of the defendant, George Zimmerman, correct? That's correct. And then I think there was some additional money that was provided to him, I think 500 or 400, and then now you've mentioned clothes, et cetera. Is that correct? I don't know about the amount. My husband deals with that. Deals with that. And, and, and for the record, your husband's name is John Donnelly, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. But you acknowledge that you, you and your husband have contributed uh, yes. to, the, to the defense fund, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, now, if I understand it correctly, there was a period of time that when he was younger, the defendant, George Zimmerman, you were close to him in terms of the business, and then your dad was sick, so for a period of time, you were focusing, obviously, on your dad. Correct. And then after he was involved in this, then you got caught up again, if I got that right? No, before. Right before, or? N no, several months prior. Okay. okay, so that would have been, if this happened in February, you're thinking December, or? Yes. Okay, December of 2011. Yes. But for a period of years, I guess you weren't keeping up with them, and then you got... Oh, we were, we were, were, were talking. We okay. just didn't get together a lot. Okay. And you mentioned that 911 call. Yes. Okay. Um, the first time you heard it was already on the news in terms of what had happened? Yes, I believe so, but I didn't hear it right away. You, so you waited a few months, you think? This happened back in February of 2012, oh, February 26th. I, when I realized what had happened because of prior uh, jury experience, right. I tried to not so you, watch or listen or read about it. So you heard about the shooting, you heard about Mr. Zimmerman being charged, then you then you listened to it on the radio or on, was there a recording played or how did you listen to it? I think the first time I heard it, it was on TV. Okay, and do you recall, was it like this year, 2013, or was it last year, 2012? You know, I don't really know. Okay. I know you gave your deposition in, in May of this year. Do you think it was before you, your deposition? Oh, right? yes. So it was yes. sometime before the deposition? Yes. But it could have been this year sometime? It, it, wa it was probably this year sometime, okay. but I'm thinking I may have heard it late last year. I just okay. can't right. remember. Sure, that's fine. And, and, and the occasion for you hearing it, was it over the news or was a separate recording played for you? I don't really know. Okay. I, I, I'm thinking the situation was that the TV was on in the background and I was in the kitchen. Sure. Okay. And we, did you hear the news? Was there a story about the George Zimmerman case and then the, they played the recording? Or do you recall the situation, the circumstances on you hearing it? I don't recall. Okay. And, and if you don't remember something, as Mr. O'Mara said, it's perfectly all right to say you don't recall. We're just trying to... Make sure the jury understands the circumstances. I find that's actually it, it was. It was on TV. On TV. Okay. Probably related to a news. Okay. So in other words, and and you were watching TV and it just happened, or you were. No, I was. And you heard it. Right. Okay. So my my point, I guess, in terms of establishing a context in which you heard it, it wasn't just played out of the blue, recording. There was some, no, text or something to it. I'm assuming, right? George right. Zimmerman case, and so you knew it was related to this case, right? Is that correct? I believe so. Okay, all right. And then you heard it, what Mr. Uh, O'Mara just paid for it, played for you. Yes. And then, then you heard it, you said a second time? 
Yes. Okay, and the second time you heard it, was it again the same type of situation? Similar situation. George Zimmerman, you know, the charges against him, whatever, a story about the case, and then they played the 911 call? Yes. Okay. Both times that you heard it, or have you heard it a third time too? Uh, at the deposition. You heard it in the deposition? And then today. Okay. So at the deposition, it was played for you in a recording, correct? Yes. Okay. But you had heard it prior to that in both times in the news? Yes. Right. And one time you were cooking or doing something else. The second time were you actually watching TV and it came up? No, I was. I think I was probably cooking. Both okay. Times. So both times it was kind of background noise. Background. But they said this is a George Zimmerman case and then something else and then you heard the recording. Is yes. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And I'm assuming you've never heard Trayvon Martin's voice, correct, or have you? No. Okay. And obviously you mentioned you had heard George Zimmerman prior to hearing the recording, correct? Yes, a lot. And, and you had actually heard him before yelling like he did this time, crying for help, if that's his voice, assuming that's his very, voice. Very similar. When, when I heard it, it was related to political campaign locally. And I guess there was cries for help in that campaign? No. Okay. So it was just, just yelling? Whooping it up. Okay. Whooping it up like, hey, or hooray, or something? Yes. Okay. And was it him just by himself yelling up the whole everybody in the campaign yelling it up? It was all of it, but okay. I also heard him too, sure, specifically. I'm assuming everybody involved in the campaign was whooping it up, correct? Yes. It was pretty loud at that time? Yes, it was. Okay, all right. And so you believe that you've now, based on that, able to extrapolate or say that this is definitely George Zimmerman's voice, correct? Definitely. Okay. And the recording that you heard that Mr. O'Mara played for you, it is a continuous. In other words, you believe you hear him just continuously yelling for help, correct? Yes. Okay, there's no break. In other words, he just yells help, 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 or whatever, he, whatever words. Well, there, there were some breaks in there, there that were? I heard. Okay. Yes, while the 911 call was... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking about the yells for help as opposed to the other people. Do you understand what I'm asking you? No. Okay, I, I, I apologize. You're hearing the recording, the, the one you just heard. Yes. Do you hear yells for help? Yes. Okay. Are they continuous yells for help? Well, it's hard to tell because the the person's voice who was making the call made it difficult. Okay. You're, you're saying there's somebody else speaking. Yes. Okay. And you don't recognize that voice, obviously. No, okay. I do not. But the yells for help, you're continuous, other than the person breaking in, yell, saying something to the... To the... Sound, okay. Sounds like they are, but it's very difficult for me to tell. Okay. So it's difficult for you to really hear the voice? or No, I hear the voice. Okay. I hear the voice clearly. Sure. And since you've contributed on his behalf, you want to believe it's George Zimmerman, correct? It is George Zimmerman. Okay. And that's your opinion? Yes. And that's all, you, that's all you can testify about? Correct. And did you have an occasion to discuss it with your husband too, in terms of what his, whether that was the voice or not? We tried not to discuss this. Is that on purpose? On purpose. Okay. I gather when he contributed to, to on, his, on behalf of the defendant, did he discuss that with you or did he do that on his own? He did that on his own. Okay. I was not in a discussion. You found he, out about it after? After the fact and okay. he, Sad. Sure. I hope that's okay with you. I mean, I said yes, okay. of course. And you approved of it, of course. Yes. Okay. I didn't mean to imply he was doing something sneaky. Um, did you hear any other recordings in this case? No, not to my recollection. Okay. Did you hear any other recordings about his call, his being George Zimmerman's call to the police? that day? No, I don't recall hearing that. Is there any reason why if you would have heard the story? You don't know why? No, Be okay. because I was trying not to pay attention. On purpose? On purpose. Okay. I was trying not, I know that the news was going to be covering it and I just, and plus my work schedule, I'm not always home anyway. Sure. If I play something for you, would you be able to recognize the voice that's that's on there? Do you think? I'll try. Okay. You 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 haven't heard that recording where he's calling the police. I don't think so. Where there's profanity being being used. I don't think so. Okay. 
Yeah. Unless oh, you we, played it in a deposition, I don't. Yeah, and I, that wasn't a trick question. I'm just asking okay. whether. Uh, may I approach you? thing and then uh, I'll play a certain part. For the record it states 173. Hey, we've had some break-ins in my neighborhood, and there's a real suspicious guy. Uh, it's Retreat View Circle. Um, the best address I can give you is 111 Retreat View Circle. This guy looks like he's up to no good, or he's on drugs or something. It's raining, and he's just walking around looking about. Okay, this guy, is he white, black, or Hispanic? He looks black. Did you see what he was wearing? Yeah, a dark hoodie, like a gray hoodie, and either jeans or sweatpants and white tennis shoes. He's here in the room, and he's just staring. Oh, he's just walking around the area? at all the houses. Okay. And now he's just staring at me. Okay, and so it's one 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 retrieve you or 111? That's the, that's the clubhouse. That's the clubhouse. That's the Do you know what the, he's near the clubhouse right now? Yeah, now he's coming towards me. Okay. He's got his hand in his waistband. And he's a black male. Okay. How old would you say he is? He's got a button on his shirt. Late teens. Late teens, okay. Mm hmm Something's wrong with him. Yep. He's coming to check me out. He's got something in his hands. I don't know what his deal is. Okay, just let me know if he does anything, okay? Yeah, we got him on the way. Just let me know if this guy does anything else. Okay. Ah, these assholes, they always get away. Yep. When you come to the clubhouse, you come straight in and make a left. Actually, you, you go past the clubhouse. Oh, it says on the left-hand side from the clubhouse? No, you go in straight through the entrance, and then you make a left. Uh, yeah, you go straight in, don't turn and make a left. Shit, he's running. He's running? Which way is he running? Uh, down towards the, uh, other entrance of the neighborhood. Okay, which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. Okay. What is your name? George. G-Ramp. All right, George, what's your last name? Zimmerman. And George, what's the phone number you're calling from? 407-435-2400. All right, George, would you have them on the way? Do you want to meet with the officer when they get out there? Yeah. All right, where are you going to meet with them at? Um, if they come in through the uh, gate, I'm going to go straight past the clubhouse and uh, straight past the clubhouse and make a left. And then they go past the mailboxes. You'll see my truck. Okay, what, what address are you parked in front of? Um, I don't know. It's a cut through, so I don't know the address. Okay, do you live in the area? Yeah. yeah well, what's, the, what's your apartment number? It's a home. It's 1950. Oh, crap, I don't want to get it. I don't know where this kid is. Okay, do you want to just be with him right near the mailboxes, bud? Yeah, that's fine. All right, George, I'll let him know to meet you with the other. Actually, could you, have him, could you have him call me and I'll tell him where I'
Any more number or you got it? Yeah, I, I got it. 407-435-2400? Yeah, you got it. Okay. No problem. I'll let them know to call you when they're in the area. Thanks. You're welcome. Ms. Benjamin, I played the whole thing because you indicated you had not heard that, correct? Is that the first I, time you're hearing it? That's the first time I've heard the whole thing, but I realized that I have heard some bits and pieces okay. as part of news. All right, so you had heard parts of it through the news? Yes. Okay, and you recall at this time what parts you heard of that? Perhaps the part where he was trying to give an address. Okay, all right. But I'm assuming you recognize at least one of the voices on there. Absolutely. And that is definitely George Zimmerman, correct? Definitely no George. dispute in your mind. No dispute okay. in my and mind. And when you listen to it now, could you tell that there was a change in his voice in terms of he appeared to be excited or uh, doing something besides just a normal monotone? To me, maybe like he's walking outside and perhaps okay. winded or it's windy. Or maybe even running. Right? I don't know. You weren't there, but no. I'm just going on based on this voice. His voice does change, you acknowledge, when after he says he's, he's running, and then you acknowledge that Mr. Zimmerman's voice does change, correct? Yes, it seems to change. Right. And in fact, you heard some profanity there, didn't you? I didn't, I'm not asking I you didn't to repeat pick it. it out. I don't know. You want me to play that part again? I'm not asking you to repeat it, please. I'm not. Perhaps, okay. but, well, go ahead. Okay, uh, well, he used, pardon my language, he used these assholes always get away. You recall <coughs> hearing that? I don't recall okay. hearing that. Do you want me to play it again? I don't mean to. No. Okay. Well, do you acknowledge that his voice changes in, in when he's speaking it's, to the... It sounds like maybe the, the environment he's in changed to me more. Okay, so he's than, moving... Like he might be walking or right. it might be windy. Okay. But but would you acknowledge, and the reason I asked you because you mentioned you had heard his voice change on prior occasions when he was, yes. I think you described whooping it up like celebrating, correct? Yes. Is, is that what you were making reference to yes. in that campaign? Yes. When you and a bunch of other people were there, you know, I think you used the word whooping it up or getting excited, correct? Yes. So you acknowledge that in this conversation that you heard between Mr. Zimmerman and the 911 or non-emergency operator that he's, his voice does change in some manner. Yes, okay. not, not like the, the pep rally. Well, he, he's, he's, not, he's not going, hey, right? He's not, he's not screaming. Correct. It, right. it, it, the, his voice seems more matter of fact to me. And this and, one? Yes. Okay. Then, then uh, you know, well, it just seems to me that it may have been outside Sure. While he's okay. walking, or it's windy, or sure. something. Sure. All right. Well, let me. Can you play the? I'm going to play a part for you because I. And obviously, you weren't there, so. Correct. correct. I was not you, there. Just asking you, based on the voice, on Mr. Zimmerman's voice, I want to play one snippet of it for you that you heard. Recall hearing that now? Were you able to yes. hear it clearly? Yes. You, you agree that his voice does change there, correct? No. You don't think it changes from what he was saying before? I know he the words were changed. I'm talking about you don't think his voice inflection changes at all? Not necessarily right there. Okay. And then um, You recall hearing yeah. this? He goes straight in. Don't turn and make a left. Shit. He's running. He's running. Which way is he running? Down towards the, uh, the entrance of the neighborhood. Okay. Which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. Did you hear the, that last part? Yes, I did. Did you hear part of my language, these fucking punks? Yes, I was listening more for the background noise. You were I'm hearing sorry. for the noise. Yes. So you, you heard the defendant say, pardon my language, shit, he's running, and then he utters these fucking punks. 
Do you recall that? I'm sorry, I was listening very carefully for the background noise. Let me do this. If, if I could, may I approach a witness, Your Honor? Yes, I'm you gonna, may. I'm going to get closer to you. I'm going to put it right in front of you. If you want to, we can get you some headphones if you need. I just want to make sure. Okay. Well, let me play it again and then just focus on what was being okay. said. Can you so you want me to pay attention to more what he was saying yes, than the background noise, yeah. whether it's wind or he's walking. Right, or he's running, yes. Yeah, he goes straight in. Don't turn and make a left. Shit, he's running. He's running. Which way is he running? Down towards the uh, entrance of the neighborhood. Okay, which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. Can you hear it now? Yes. Okay. So you heard shit he's running. Yes. And then you heard which these yes. effing punks. Yes. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. And you would agree that there's also background noise. Yes. And that right? seems to be between where he said that I'm running or he's running. Right. Okay. And the next thing he says. Right that it sounds like either wind picked okay. up or he was walking okay. to me. All right. But you agree that, that he's uttering that in terms of he's trying to follow somebody or do whatever. Or you weren't No, I, I don't take it that way at all. I think he was just observing. Okay. So he's just observing and making a comment, oh, shit, pardon my language, he's running these fucking punks? That's just an observation in your mind? When he's referencing the person that he's following or observing? The object, if I might, the speculation on it. Overruled. May I be here at the bench? It, it may, I may have the question read back. I thought he was asking for what? We can have the question read back if you need it read back, but Forward. no need to approach the bench. I was just observing a comment that part of my language concerning these fucking punks. That, that's an observation in your mind when he's referencing the person that he's following or observing. And I renew my request that there is speculation as to what the speaker of the no. words was thinking. So no speaking objections, and based upon her previous answer, the objection is overruled. You believe when he uttered the words, part of my language, these fucking punks is just an observation? I think it was a comment he was making. About the individual he was following or chasing, correct? I don't know how to answer that. I think he was just making an observation at the beginning. He may have had a, a, a comment to make. Okay. But you agree but that. But I don't think he was in an extremely excited state at that point based on my experience with him. Okay. All right. And um, you did something when you listened to that. I closed my eyes. You closed your eyes. Did you close your eyes when you listened to the other 911 recording originally? Originally, no. So this time you really wanted to focus on what yes. was being said and who was uttering it. So mm -hmm. you close your eyes. The second, the first time when you were watching, you were doing stuff around the house, so you didn't have, you didn't close your eyes. You weren't prepared for it, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, um, are you saying that in those campaign things and all that, he was uttering, part of my language, these fucking punks? No. Okay. So you agree there's a distinction, correct? Distinction between? In terms of that language that was being used. Well, yes. OK. And you heard the part already. You clearly made out the, the other language, part of my language. Um, these assholes always get away, correct? I heard that. OK. And. His voice didn't change at all there? It may have been starting to change a little bit, okay. but I think that he was commenting and giving out or trying to give out information. About the person he was observing? Yes. Okay. And so, in other words, based on what you observed and based on his knowledge of hearing his voice, you believe he was just making comment like referring to the person as an asshole, part of my language, and a fucking punk, right? I heard those words, but I don't, 
I don't think it was in a heightened state of alert. I think it was just more conveying information. Just like an observation, like I would say, uh, you know, Joe, and, and refer to some profanity when I refer to Joe, right? Just like an everyday observation of somebody. Yes, I've heard that before. Right? Usually it's expressing some kind of anger, isn't it? Not necessarily. So it's a complimentary term? Not necessarily. <laughs> okay. But I have encountered people who use language like that in a conversation and it doesn't necessarily come across to me as angry or excited just conversation like a matter of fact especially with my kids okay with your kids mm -hmm. okay in terms of you're talking about okay I, I don't mean to get personal in terms of you're talking about well when cussing okay all right Profanity. it does not it does not always indicate that there's you know, an alarming situation. Some but it people, could. Yes, it could, but it's, it, in this situation, it did not to me. And that's all you can go on because you weren't there, but you agree. I apologize, I cut you off. You finishing? Yes. Okay. Did I, did I, did I interrupt you? I've... I don't know. Go ahead and ask another question. Okay. My question is, you agree that in this case, based on what you heard, he was observing somebody and he was making comments about the individual he's observing, right? Yes, or about okay. the situation the situation and he's wanting to make sure the person doesn't get away I don't know that I, I think he was just reporting on what he okay saw okay so you the bottom line is you believe he was just making an observation a report in terms of using yes. that those words mm -hmm. to describe the person he's reporting about yes okay now why when he was originally asked about the individual and asked in terms of what's his race he referred to him as a black male why didn't, at that time, did he say he's a black male fucking punk? I, um, if he's just making an object? observation. When you're done. When okay, you're what's done. your objection? Speculation. Sustained. I have no further okay. questions. Thank you. Um, any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Um, That's back. okay. Thanks, though. morning again. Um, so now you've heard the second tape. Yes. You had not heard that before in its entirety? Correct. Okay. Now that you've had a, a listen, um, can you tell me anywhere in that tape um, where you heard um, George Zimmerman speaking in an angry way? No. In a way that evidenced to you that he had ill will or spite? No. That he was um, um, acting with hatred for whoever may have been the subject of his conversation? No. When you heard Mr. Zimmerman use the term assholes, um, did you interpret it? saying it the same way that Mr. Delorionder just said it in his question? No. Tell the jury, if you would, how you noticed the difference between the way Mr. Delorionder just said it to you and how you've heard Mr. Delorionder, I'm sorry, Mr. Zimmerman say it. It seemed to me like Mr. Delorionder was trying to highlight it, make it sound heightened, and I don't feel that it was that way at all. And uh, I think it was more a statement of comment. You, you mentioned that you have children? Yes, I have okay. two sons. Um, their ages? 30 and 33. Okay. Um, in conversations with them, have you heard them use such words as, and let me premise this, in a courtroom we're, we're bound by the evidence, so when the evidence is curse words, we use the curse words that we, just so you're knowing why, I'm just questioning you about curses, okay? Have you heard your sons use words like assholes before? Yes, I have. Um, the word shit, have you heard that before? Yes, I have. Um, does that always connotate anger, ill will, spite? And Not at all. Okay. And do you think it did 
from listening to George Zimmerman's voice in this recording? Not at all. You heard the, um, the words, um, and you close your eyes. Why, why did you close your eyes to listen to that tape? Since I had been asked about a question and Mr. Del Riondo asked or said something about running, I was trying to listen very carefully to see if I could hear that. Okay. And was it only by concentrating that you could even, third time through, hear the words <laughs> fucking punks? Yes. Um, describe I for, didn't hear it the first time. It was. Like, describe for the jury the difference that you noticed in the way Mr. Zimmerman said the words fucking punks on that tape and the way Mr. Delory owned it presented it to you in his cross-examination. I think Mr. Zimmerman said it more as a matter of fact kind of casual comment type thing. And I got the feeling Mr. Delariondo, while I could hear it in his voice, his voice was louder and he was highlighting those words. When you were talking about this change in voice, were you indicating to the jury that you believed that it was apparent that George changed his emotional status or just his location? Not at all. It seemed more locational, perhaps, that he was or it was windy. Was there ever a time in that that you thought that the tape evidenced that Mrs. Zimmerman was acting, acting in an angry way? Not at all. So when asked the question by Mr. Delorionda, did you hear, I'm just not going to keep repeating, but did you hear those words um, being yelled by Mrs. Zimmerman in a campaign event? I think you said no. No. But you have, in fact, heard him yell, or maybe Absolutely. happy yelling, yes. uh, during a campaign. Yes. Vote for us, vote for my guy. Yes. Down with the other guy. Pep rallies and okay. such. Matter of fact, that's sort of part of a campaign, isn't it? Absolutely. Get everyone motivated. Get everybody excited and motivated. So yes, I have heard him in that setting. And is that part of the experience level you bring to your testimony here today, having, Mrs. having heard Mrs. Zimmerman scream even though in a happy way? Yes. Of course, you've never heard him scream for his life before, have you? No. But you did hear him on that 911 call? Yes, I did. We talked about, or you were asked about, the continuous nature of the calling. I'm going to posit two different possibilities to see if we can vet through that a little bit. Sure. If I were to scream, one scream over the next, till my breath ran out, 30 seconds, you know, ah. Um, compare that to if I were to scream in segments, sort of with a cadence. Do you know what that is? I say that it sounds more like that. Which one? The second one. More like a several screens in cadence. Yes. Okay. Maybe times for breathing in between. Yes. <laughs> Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Any Very briefly, Your Honor. Um, I was speaking louder so you could make sure you heard the words. You're saying that Mr. Zerman, since he was aware he was being recorded, was uttering it under his breath, correct? I, I, can't, I don't know about that. Well, I think he was just talking. Right, but you agree that the effing punks, it's profanity, the, the first word, I'm trying not to repeat it, was uttered under his breath, in other words, because he knew he was being recorded. I don't know that at all. Um, the second half of that's speculation. Sustained. You agree that he was, it was hard, difficult to hear it, the effing and then punks. You agree to that, correct? I heard it. I had to play it for you a few times, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any re redirect? Any question? If you wanted to say something, and you were on a phone call with somebody, let's say being recorded. So if you wanted to say something under your breath to make sure it wasn't recorded, what would you do with the phone that was out your mouth? I'd take it away from my head. Nothing further. 
Okay, thank you. May Ms. Benjamin be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much. You are excused. It is 11.25. Do you want a break or go straight through to lunch? They're good. Call your next witness. Um, Dora Singleton, Your Honor. Sure. Yes, you may. Testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Sound of God. I do. You may proceed. Thank sir. you. Good morning, sir. How are you? Just fine. State your name, please. John Donnelly. And your occupation? I'm a retired physician's assistant. Uh, now I do litigation support for uh, attorneys and law firms and medical malpractice. Okay. Tell me what a physician's assistant does. Uh, <clears throat> physician assistant basically uh, augments a physician's uh, services in MD. Uh, I was trained in trauma surgery and uh, internal medicine. How long um, had you been a PA? That's, that's the normal term, is that <clears throat> PA? Yes, since uh, 1973. Okay, can we use that term as we go forward, a PA, and we yes, know sir. what we're talking about? Great. Since 1973, and when you say that you're trained in trauma, what do you mean by that? Uh, major trauma, uh, auto accidents, gun wrecks, I mean, gunshots, stabbings. Uh, it's at Emory University uh, in Atlanta, and I trained mainly at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. And uh, you know George Zimmerman? Yes, sir. And how do you know him? Uh, George Zimmerman is a friend of mine. I've known him for since about 2002, 2003. Uh, he's just a very good friend of mine. We um, have just heard from your wife, obviously. Probably passed in the hallway. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate some of your testimony in that regard. But um, the jury, the um, just a bit about your friendship with both George Zimmerman and his wife Shelley Zimmerman. Uh, we met George. Uh, my, my wife is a real estate uh, broker, and she owns her own business. And we had an office in a building, uh, kind of a one-story ranch type building, Lake Mary Boulevard, and the insurance company was in one side and her real estate office was in the other side. I have my own business and uh, my wife had an extra room in there, so my office is right next to hers and uh, we get along pretty well, so that worked out uh, very well for us. And we have worked right next to each other for 15 years now. Okay. Would you? Sure. Um, would you just give us a, a feel for how the friendship between yourself and Mrs. Zimmerman and or his wife has grown over the past several years? Uh, our friendship really uh, started uh, with uh, George all times coming to our offices. We always had refrigerators full of sodas and food and microwaves. Uh, George uh, took care of a lot of our insurance policies, all of our policies 
or, or with the insurance company. Uh, George helped us out a lot with that. Uh, we just got to be uh, good friends with George. Uh, uh, he was just a very smart, sharp young guy, and uh, he'd just stop in, especially a lot of times after work, where we'd be there until 7 o'clock or so, and George would, would come in and sit and talk with us, especially about uh, business stuff. He was very interested in in business and starting his own business and how we, we were doing. Uh, and we just got to be very close to him. Uh, one time he came in and uh, asked me to show him how to tie a Windsor knot in a tie. Uh, and that just uh, touched a very little personal part of my heart. And, and he's always been there ever since. So we credit you for the tie he's wearing? Yes, sir. Okay. Matter of fact, we can probably credit you for more than just the tie, I understand, is that correct? Did you help him with some clothing to get ready for his trial? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I took George down and uh, I believe I bought him and three I'm suits. Sorry, let me interrupt you because I didn't tell you as well. We're very used to talking in familiar terms with our friends, George, Mark, whatever. In courtroom, we need to use full surname so that not only the record is clear, but the formality of the courtroom. So I apologize for not mentioning that to you earlier, but yes, when you mentioned George, please tell us his full name, okay? Yes, I, I uh, took Mr. Zimmerman down to uh, a clothing store and uh, I purchased him uh, suits, ties, shirts uh, for a courtroom. Uh, uh, it, it's, I've been in and out of courtrooms many times not testifying, uh, which can be a terrifying experience. Uh, but I've been taught by, by my attorney clients that when you come to a courtroom, you, you dress to, out of respect for and the that was one of the sorry. That was one of the ways you supported him, helping him out with some clothing? Yes, sir. You've also donated um, money to his legal defense fund, have you? Yes, sir. And you consider him a friend? Very close friend. Um, have you tell the jury um, sort of the spectrum of voice that you've heard about George from conversational tones to yelling or whatever you have as your sort of experience level for his voice? Uh, yes, I have very close experience level with his voice, both in casual conversation, uh, uh, laughing, lunches, dinners. Uh, we were in several political campaigns, for much my feet still hurt. <laughs> uh, and uh, George and I would be holding up signs and yelling and so forth uh, during the campaigns. Okay. Um you had not listened to the, what we now call the Lauer 911 call uh, until recently, is that correct? Yes. When you were, before you studied um, to become a PA, had you had any medical experience before that? Uh, I was a combat medic in Vietnam. Explain what that is. Uh, you're rendering medical aid uh, to your men that are hurt, injured. So it, it, go through, if you would, uh, and um, apologize to the extent we're bringing you back to that. But within, with that as a, as a premise, if you would explain to the jury what a normal day is in the life of a combat medic in Vietnam. <clears throat> Well, if everybody will give me a little patience here. Uh, when you're in the Army, you're with 60, 100 men. Uh, you eat, sleep, shower uh, with them on a daily basis. Oftentimes, you're sharing your bunks with them. Uh, I got in Vietnam in December of 67, and uh, through yeah, December. I apologize, sir. I'm going to object as to relevance. Um, please approach.
Mr. Dunn, we were talking about your experience as a medic in Vietnam. I think you were saying that you'd gotten there in 1967? Uh, I got there in de December 1967. Through and December, how long were you there? To uh, December of 1968. So approximately a full year? Yes, sir. Um, and were you there as a medic the entire time? Yes, sir. So um, you were telling us that you basically are how many medics are there available for these 60 to 100 men in the group that you were telling us about? Uh, there could be uh, two to four uh, based on what the mission was uh, for that day. Uh, generally, you, you try to have at least two available for uh, a full company of men, which could vary from 40 to 60 depending upon availability. And then the medics are responsible, obviously, for the medical care for the um, combat troops? Yes, sir, for the men who get wounded and, and hit. Now, when we talk, is company the right term? I, you know, uh, there's troops and companies and battalions. Companies, I, well, there's squad, company, platoons. Uh, basically, uh, you might be in a, a squad search and destroy. You might be in a full platoon search and destroy. You might be in a full company. Okay. The, the 60 to the 100 combat soldiers that you were working with, can we come up with the terms so that we know what we're talking about? Can we call that the company? Yes. Or, okay. So even though it might not be precisely accurate according to the U.S. Army, for our purposes, we'll call that group of combat, and it was mostly it was men back then in the 60s, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's call them combat men of that company. Okay? Yes, sir. So you, maybe one to three other medics were responsible for the medical care of that company? Yes, sir. These were, were these people that you would be with throughout the day and throughout the week and the month and the year? You're with them through the day, through the night. You're with them at all times. Um, have an opportunity to talk to them and interact with them? Uh, yes, sir, when you were back at base camp, uh, that's all you did was really take care of your equipment and talk and, you know, the scuttlebutt that goes on in, in the military, uh, mess halls and, and so forth. Uh, you talk all day long because there's really nothing else to do. Until the combat begins. Until you get sent out on a mission, yes, sir. Okay. During those times and with all of those men in the company, did you have an opportunity to talk to them both? conversationally and, and what other communication yelling screaming laughing anything like that well obviously the the casual conversations uh, laughing joking sometimes drunken after a 90 degree beers uh, but once you got into combat then of course the voices change so you, so you had a chance, and I'm, I know the timing isn't going to be right, but you would interact with the soldiers during the day, correct? Yes, sir. Presuming that the missions were at night, and I know that wasn't always true, but for our purposes, hanging out with them during the day, missions might occur at night, is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you then have an opportunity where you would have to when do you do your work? What happens that causes you to now have to be a medic and do something? Uh, well, at base camp, you took care of the normal routine medical issues that come up from colds or uh, people, lacerations or anything else that happens. Once you're in the field uh, and once you get into combat and in 1968, I think uh, everybody remembers that was the Tet Offensive. Uh, it started the um, end of that January, and you could be fighting in the field for five, ten days straight. Uh, Did you then have an opportunity as a medic to have to attend to people that you knew during the day as they were wounded in combat? Yes. And tell the jury 
about that? <clears throat> it's a little difficult. Well, let me, let me, if I, let me, I was just going to sort of see if I, I could read him. There's been a request to approach the bench. I don't know what it's about. Yes, so ma'am. Please approach. Okay, Mr. Donnelly, we were at the point where I think we were talking to you about your opportunity to interact with the soldiers on a daily basis and then sometimes having to go out to deal with them after being wounded in combat. With that as a premise, tell me about you would be called out to do what? Uh, in the midst of combat, uh, there are a lot of people yelling screaming. Uh, sometimes they're yelling, barking out orders. Other times they're yelling for ammo. Sometimes they're yelling for a medic. And sometimes they're screaming for help. Okay. And um, based upon the year that you spent doing that, were you able to distinguish the yelling for help, or the asking for a medic, um, and compare that to those people that you had heard the day or the day of or the day before in regular conversational tone? When uh, you're in a combat situation like that, in the, in the den of battle, uh, for some reason I, you develop, uh, I'm not sure what you would call it, an ability, but when you hear that, you can distinguish the screams for help, distinguish the screams for a medic. You grab your rifle, you grab your medic's kit. Your job is to run. You go to where they're at, but invariably, because you know your, the men you're with, you know the men that you eat, sleep with, you know who it's gonna be before you get there. And you can tell that from hearing their voice screaming for help and comparing that to what you heard in your everyday life with them? Yes. Okay. Um, I had started this a moment ago by talking to you about the evidence in this case and whether or not you had listened to the um, phone call, the 911 call in this case. Um, had you listened to it? 
Well, when was the first time that you listened to it? Uh, I had heard pieces of it inadvertently, uh, listening to the news or whatever, and I generally tuned it out and walked away. I really didn't want to. Uh, why? Tell the jury why you didn't want to listen to this tape. Uh, it can be very uh, distressing. To listen to a friend of yours scream for help, if in fact it was a friend of yours? Yes. And is that why you didn't listen to the tape? That's why. But you have listened to it recently, is that correct? I listened to it uh, on this past Saturday morning, sitting in my office alone. And uh, I found it on the internet somewhere, and I played it exactly twice. I'm going to play it for you again, if I might. This is the tape that is in evidence. I'm not sure if you listen to on the internet, but I'm going to ask if you would listen to this. I'm going to play it one time through um, to the end of the tape. And then if you want me to play it again, let me know. If you want me to go back to a certain point, let me know. At the end of which, I'm going to ask if you have an opinion concerning who you hear on the tape, OK? Yes, sir. Um, obviously, I'm talking about not the person who's speaking to the 911 operator, but the noise in the background, OK? Maybe both, I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. Okay, what's the address that they're near? 1211 Twin Trees Lane. Twin Trees Lane? Is this in the Twin Lake Town, Tom's and Sanford? Yes. Okay, and is it a male or a female? It sounds like a male. And you don't know why? I don't know why. I think they're yelling help, but I don't know. Just send someone quick, please. Okay, does he look hurt to you? <laughs> I can't see him. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's going on. So they're sending. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right. What is your <laughs> <on> the <laughs> Is that the tape or very similar to the tape that you've listened to last week? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you have an opinion as to whose voice that is um, screaming in the background? Yes, sir. Based upon your knowledge of your conversation with George Zimmerman and the life experience that you've now brought to the jury, whose voice do you believe that to be screaming for help? Uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that is George Zimmerman. And I wish to God I did not have that ability to understand that. I think very well. I think it's still morning. Good morning, Mr. Donnelly. Hello, sir. Mr. Donnelly. You recall, I took a deposition of you back, I believe it was May 9th, maybe, of this year, correct? Yes, That's sir. That's about right? Yes, sir. I think your wife was first, or maybe you were first and then your wife, you recall oh, that? my wife was first. Okay. As it should be, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And then we took yours and it was very brief, correct? Yes, sir. You never mentioned anything about testifying, about identifying the voice, or did you? Uh, I don't believe I did, sir. All right. Don't believe it was asked. Uh, as I recall, everybody was hungry. <laughs> okay. So you think it was just short, or you you didn't mention anything about that? Didn't I ask you what you were going to be testifying about? Uh, I don't believe. I don't remember being asked if I was going to testify about it at, at the time. Uh, well, through this whole thing, I, I really didn't want anything to do with the tape. Right. Okay. So you, what you're saying is after the deposition on May 9th, 2013, you said it was last Saturday that you, on purpose, listened to the tape, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And Your Honor, I have a address that after we finish. So you, after the deposition and between literally last Saturday, 
So we're talking about like on the, I guess today's the 8th. So we're talking about the 6th is when you listen to the recording. Yes, sir. It was the, it was Saturday morning. And I apologize. We're talking about last Saturday, literally. This, this last Saturday. All right. A couple and, of days ago. Right, because my recollection is in the deposition you had not listened to the recording or really were going to testify about it, correct? I, I may have heard parts of it, but I I generally try to, I mean, I always tuned it out. I walked right. away from it. it on it purpose, was, I think it, you said, on correct? On purpose. It was very distressing. Right. Sure. And so what you did is two days ago, you on purpose listened to it to see whether you could identify the voice so you'd be able to testify in court, correct? Uh, I listened to it uh, very purposely in a very quiet setting because I think I just needed to before sure. I came here today. All right. And I think you said you listened to it twice. Yes, sir. I understand sir. you correctly. Now, uh, if I may, why did you have to listen to it twice if you, at the first time, knew it was George Zimmerman's voice? I don't know. I just played it a second time. Just to verify it in your mind that you would be sure that you could come to court and say, absolutely? No. It, it was just an emotional okay. uh, experience for me, and I okay. don't even know why I played it twice, okay. but I did. Okay. And I gather you were you made sure you were in a room setting where nobody else was present, correct? Yes. Okay. And I, I believe your wife already testified, and obviously you weren't in the courtroom when she testified. My question is, prior to listening to that tape on Saturday, had you discussed it with your wife at all what, in terms of whether she had listened to the tape at all? And I'm not saying that that was improper. I'm just saying, had you, do you recall? Not really. I, we, we've never really tried to discuss much of anything okay. with this. All right. Um, she mentioned, or I know when we took your deposition, you had mentioned that you had given money before to the defense fund. Yes, sir, I have. And, and, I, and I think it was $2,500 at that time, correct? Uh, I gave a check for $2,500 for his uh, defense, and then I gave $500 to his personal website. Right, so you, that was 3000 and then after that, you bought him suits? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall how much approximately money? How much About seventeen hundred dollars. Okay, and then that includes ties and shirts and all that other stuff that you were asked. Yes, about. sir. They were on sale. Okay. Was that a Joseph Banks? Do you want to plug wherever you bought it? No. I'm, did you get a good deal on those? I gather is what you're saying. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, and and you testified because you you come to court before people need to appear a certain way in court properly, et cetera. Correct. Yes, sir. It okay. Shows respect for the system. Yes, yes sir. And so you would agree that there's a bias there on your behalf of, of George Zimmerman, correct? Because of your friendship. He is my very dear friend. Yes, I think yes, of him sir. as a son. All right. And, and in other words, you contributed money to help his cause, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then you also, as you mentioned, of clothing, et cetera. Yes, sir. Okay. So is that it in terms of uh, total? So that was, you said 3000 and then about $1,700. So that's about $4,700, give or take a little. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, other than taking food right. to his I, home. Yes, sir. I, other than that, I'm talking about monetarily or uh, monetarily. That that is that is it. Sir. Okay. All right. And then. Um, did you listen to any other recordings? Specifically, the recording where George Zimmerman is speaking to the 911 non-emergency operator. Uh, I believe I heard part of that on the news. Okay. Was that about the same time, or was that recently, or, or back in February or March or April of last year? Uh, that, was, uh, that was a ways back because uh, we've tried not to watch anything. On purpose? Is that correct? Yes. I, I know you're nodding your head, so uh, I knew the answer yeah. was yes, but yes, sir, we and just I need for the record. I know these jurors can see. I know better, too. Okay, all right. And so you ha you have heard parts of the non-emergency only snippets that you think or probably snippets. I really okay. try not to pay too sure. much. Okay. And those snippets, do you recall what was said in, in the parts you heard on on the news? Not really, sir. Okay. Um, let me do if, if I want to do is I'm going to play a recording for you if I could. Yes, sir.
And for the record, that's State's Exhibit. What number is it? 173. 173. Police Department, why is there a report to the Hey, we've had some break-ins in my neighborhood, and there's a real suspicious guy. Uh, it's Retreat View Circle. Um, the best address I can give you is 111. Do you recognize the voice? Yes, sir. Or one of the two voices, right? Yes, sir. And one of them is, is George Zimmerman, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So far, is that just a normal conversation you would have heard on a regular basis with Mr. Zimmerman? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now he's just staring at me. Okay, so it's 1111 retrieve you or 111? That's the, that's the clubhouse. That's the clubhouse. That's the Do you know what the, he's near the clubhouse right now? Yeah, now he's coming towards me. Okay. He's got his hand in his waistband. Yes, sir. Okay. Said something. Oh, God, these assholes, they always get away. Did you hear that language? You want me to play it back? Or? My, Your Honor, I, I would judge it's a mischaracterization of the evidence. He added words that didn't exist in the tape. Um, sustained, if you want to. Do you want me to play it back for you? Oh. Yes, sir. Okay. Would you agree that based on your experience and his voice, he's a little more excited than previously? No, sir. You think he's just the same monotone? monotone? Everybody has different tones to their okay. voice as, as they're speaking, much right. like I am now, but right. he's speaking to law enforcement and he's uh, trying to give them information. Okay. And so you had not heard that before? I hadn't heard that part before, no. Okay. And, the, and I don't need to play the whole thing. You heard another part dealing with where he uses the words, uh, some der other derogatory words. You had not heard that before? Uh, I, I may have heard snippets of it, sir, but uh, I'm hearing I, everything pretty much fully today. Okay. Um, so you were trying to become familiar with his voice, I guess, you were already familiar with his voice, but you were trying to compare it to just the 911 recording on Saturday? Yes, sir. Okay, you didn't go back and listen to any other recordings? No. Okay, that's what I was trying to get. You, you didn't compare it to any other voices that he had made prior calls or anything like that? No, sir, I didn't need to. Okay, because okay. you already knew his voice? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, all right. Now, on that recording um, that you listened to, the 911 operator, I'm sorry, the the, they're calling it the Lauer, the one that Mr. O'Mara played for you. I'm not going to play it again. You know which one I'm talking about? The one yes, you listened Saturday. I apologize. Yes, sir. Okay. It was similar to the one that was played in court, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And you heard the person you believe is George Zimmerman yelling, help, 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 continuously, correct? That was absolutely George Zimmerman. Right. And he was yelling, no, no doubt in your mind, you, you believe it's George Zimmerman. There's not a single doubt in my mind, sir. Okay. And he was yelling over and over, help, 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 correct? Yes, and I heard others, there's like other screams, help, but the screams in particular, I, I could tell, I, I knew that that was George Zimmerman. So you heard other screams too? Sure. There was help, there was some other ones. I, those particular 
<clears throat> emotional. Obviously, when someone is uh, in dire straits, whether it be in combat or anything else, your voice obviously changes. I've heard a 250 pound man, I mean, sound like a little girl right. screaming. And you, but before you get there, you even, you know who he is. Right, so, so you had, you believe there was some that were definitely George Zimmerman and others you heard you couldn't make out who it was. Did I understand you correctly? The voices I heard screaming and for help were George Zimmerman. There All were other them. voices up on top of that. Uh, in the tape, there's 911 operator, there's uh, other stuff, which oddly enough, I'm familiar with because in the din of battle, you have a lot of extraneous other noises going on at the same time. Other but people as yelling or other people, whatever, speaking? Other people yelling. At the okay. same time, you've got small arms fire, you may have mortars, rockets, you've got people screaming. Uh, but you still have the ability to pick out the ones that you have to run to as a medic. The, the ones that you're familiar with, in other words. The other people, if you weren't familiar, if some guy had shown up that day in the company and you had never heard his voice, you wouldn't be able to pick out his voice as, as, as easily as the person you're familiar with, correct? Uh, that's, that's correct, sir. Yeah. Uh, the voices that, of course, we've been together most of us, for a period of months, uh, and we all knew right. each other's voice and, and who it was. My question is, if there had been a person that had just shown up that day, and God forbid there was a firefight out there, and there was a shooting or whatever, you would not have been able, if you had never heard his voice, you wouldn't be able to pick out that person's voice? Uh, no, sir. After right. that February, we had a lot of new guys. Okay. And in this case, the only voice you're able to pick out is George Zimmerman's voice, correct? The voice screaming on the tape is absolutely George Zimmerman, okay. sir. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. I just have a matter to bring up to the court, and we can do it. I don't know if, if there's so we finish the examination. I didn't know if it had to do with before that or not, so. I think we can do it right after. But. Okay, any redirect? Please, Your Honor. Just to clear, as you listen to the 911 tape, I thought you were saying that some of the screams were. Objection as to leading? Sustained. Uh, when you listen to the 911 tape, were all of these screams that you heard, those that said help and those that were just screaming, was that all from George Zimmerman? Yes, sir. Okay. Then there were other, other voices like the 911 operator, Ms. Lauer and others. But the background noise, who, was it one person or was it more than one person in the background? That was one person. I, uh, it was, easy for me, just based on my past experiences, very easy for me. That was George Zimmerman. Okay. And did you ever discuss with your wife um, this non-emergency? No, sir. Okay. Um, you had listened to this tape on Saturday, two days ago? Yes, sir. When did you um, contact me? I believe I called you Saturday afternoon. Right after you had done this? Yes, sir. Was that the first time that we talked about um, your testifying regarding the 911 call at all? Yes, sir. Um, was that a difficult decision for you to make? Extremely. Was it an emotional conversation um, that you and I had regarding having to deal with this issue? Yes, sir. Are you coloring or changing your testimony at all simply to help Mr. Zimmerman in what you might perceive to be a time of need? Not at all, sir. This courtroom is about truth. At some point in time, even though this is personally very hard for me, 
this is the place truth is supposed to come out. Is that why you decided to deal with whatever demons existed from 45 years ago and still testify concerning this event and those events here today? Yes. Nothing further on. Whose idea was it to listen to the recording Saturday? It was my own, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. May Mr. Donnelly be excused? Mr. Donnelly. Thank you very much, sir. You are excused. Council, approach the bench. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break for lunch. Um, there's a matter we may have to take up um, right before we come back, so I'm going to give an extra uh, 20 minutes for lunch, so if you'll come back at 1.30. Um, before you leave for lunch, I'm going to give you my admonitions, and the, they are as follows. You're not to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anybody else. Um, you're not to read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case. You're not to use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology. And you're not to read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case. Do I have your assurances that you will abide by these instructions? Yes. Okay, if you'll put your notepads down and follow Deputy Jarvis back into the jury room. Court will be in recess until 1.30. I, I guess you should move on to this is the actual note, or? I don't, I, I, I don't know what the purpose is, but rather you have tonight. Thank you. Court is in recess.